All right, so previously we've defined the infinity norm of a integrable function, or just of a function, a measurable function. Um, well, I guess it would have to be integrable. Anyways, so we defined what the infinity norm is. We've also defined what the p norm is, and just looking at the definition of a of the infinity norm, it's not entirely clear how this comes from, how this is related to the p norm. But it turns out you can prove that it's related precisely in this way, that if you take a function and you take the limit as p goes to infinity of the p norm of f, then that will be precisely the infinity norm of f. And that's exactly what you would expect. Because if this weren't true, then we probably, then why would you call it f infinity? You'd probably want to call it something else. Okay, and also, by the way, this theorem is true for finite measures, but I think you, instead of having f infinity, is it true for finite measures? Or do you have to, like, take the... It, mm, there, there might be something specific about the case where you have a probability measure, meaning that the measure of the space is 1. It might be slightly different if the measure of the space is infinite. Or no, just some other number. You end up taking the measure of the set raised to some power. This is reminding me a lot of a, of a proof of a theorem from Fallen in Chapter 6, I believe. Um, so you can go look that up. Uh, but in any case, let's go ahead and prove this theorem. Okay, so let's just, so if mu, if the measure of the entire space equals 1, by the way, this is not good notation, because um, for, like, measure theory, you typically let capital X be the underlying domain of your function f, whereas in probability theory, you typically use capital X to mean a measurable function, i.e. a random variable, a particular type of random variable, a particular type of measurable function. So it's not great notation, but I'm just going to stick with it. Okay, so if this is a probability measure, we claim that the limit as P goes to infinity of the P norm of F is precisely the infinity norm of F, which, as a reminder, this is the infimum over all M such that the measure of the set where f is greater than m in absolute value equals zero. So this is basically the ma the um, the maximum of f. It's sort of you could think of it the the maximum abs the maximum norm of f up to exclusion by sets of measure zero. Okay. So first, so. We have an equality, and so to prove it, we're going to prove inequality in both directions. So first, suppose, and again, like I mentioned in the last exercise, we'll just choose a particular m from this infimum set, and then take the infimum, and that will give us one direction. Suppose m satisfies the measure of the set where f is greater than m equals zero. Then... Now, when we're dealing with um, p norms, it's typically because the p norm involves like an integral raised to the power of one over p. It's typically easier to deal with the p norm raised to the power of p, and then take the pth root after you're done doing all the work. So if we do this, this is remember the integral of f to the p d mu because this is much easier to work with than this entire integral raised to the one over p. So this we can break into, um, and the, what am I doing here? So this is equal to the integral over the set where f is less than or equal to m in absolute value of f to the p d mu, plus the integral over the set where the absolute value of f is strictly greater than m of f to the p d mu, but that's an integration. That's an integral over a set of measure zero, because we chose m such that that set is a set of measure zero, and so we don't even need to include that integral because that that integral will just be zero, and so we just have this integral. And now, 
we can replace the absolute value of f with m, and that can only increase this integral. So this integral on the left is less than or equal to the integral over the same set. times m to the p d mu. And now this set will actually, we can, we can even expand the size of the set. Um, or rather, let's see here. No, 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 this is fine. Okay, so what is the measure of the set where the absolute value of f is less than or equal to m? Well, it's going to be well, the, the measure of the complement is zero, so the measure of this set will be the entire space, so it's going to be one. And we're integrating a, a constant over a, over a particular set, so you just take that constant times the measure of the set. And the measure of this set is one, so this is precisely m to the p. So let's see here. If this were, if we were integrating over a, um, here, and so, and so, we take this and then we take the p through now that we've done all the dirty work and we end up with the p norm of f is less than or equal to m. Okay, so this sort of shows us why, um, like I was thinking, you needed to include um, the measure of the space raised to some power. So here, if, this, if the measure of the entire space was just mu of x, then we would end up with mu of x times m to the power of p. And so we would end up with the p norm of f is less than or equal to m times the measure of x raised to the power of 1 over p. Oh, but then as you send p to infinity, that will be 0, or that, that the exponent will go to 0, and so that will be 1, and so this works. Okay, so yeah, this is fine. Um, yeah, so the f norm of p... I, th I, think you, I think you include that, um, the measure of the space raised to some power when you actually you can actually get a bound on the p norm of something in terms of its infinity norm or vice versa i forget whatever that's not part of this exercise this exercise we have this and we take the infimum over um taking the nth over all such m yields this doesn't change on the left here. On the right, if you take the infimum over all such m, you're going to end up with the infinity norm, by definition. And then you just take the limit as p goes to infinity. You get the limit as p goes to infinity of fp is going to be less than or equal to f infinity norm. So I guess in this case, because the um, the the p because the left hand side is independent. Wait, does this work? Yeah, because the left hand side is independent of m, and the right hand side is independent of p, and so it doesn't really matter. You can just take an infimum in one variable and then take a limit of p in the other variable, and it works out fine. Okay. So, this is one of the inequalities that we needed. And the other one is a little trickier, I think. Um, and so, basically, what you want to try to do is you want to think... Um, let's see here. So, it, what ends up being the key here is that um, if you want to get the infinity norm of f, all you really have to focus on is the set where f is really large in magnitude because as you as as p goes to infinity the p norm of f is going to more and more concentrate and more and more heavily weight only the set where the norm of f is large um, and so you want to be looking at that set okay so we have the limit as p goes to infinity of the p norm of f is less than or equal to this so for the reverse eh inequality note that if m is less than the infinity norm of f then 
the measure of the set where f is greater than zero, than m, then this has to be strictly greater than zero. Because the infinity norm of f is, is the infimum over all the sets m, such that the measure of the set where f is strictly greater than m is equal to zero. So here, if it were the case that the measure where f is strictly greater than m is strictly greater than zero, then m, then this m would be one of the values over which you're taking the infimum in the infinity norm definition, which means that the f infinity norm would have to be less than or equal to this given m. But that's impossible since we assume that m is strictly less than the f infinity norm. So we have this fact. And so, now let's look again at the fp norm raised to the p. Um, so let's see here. This will be equal to the set where f is, again, we're going to do the same thing as before, f to the p d mu plus integral of where f is strictly greater than m, f to the p d mu. And so now we want an inequality in the other direction than what we had before. So we want it greater than or equal to. And so remember how I said that really the only set that we're looking at here is the set where f is strictly greater than m, or the, the set where f is large in absolute value. So all that really should be important here is the set where the norm of f is greater than m. And in fact, we can just throw this, this term, um, this integral over the set where the norm of f is less than or equal to m, that this integral is going to be some positive number. So if we throw it out, we're going to get a smaller number. So let's just do that. Let's just get rid of it. So the thing on the left is going to be greater than or equal to just this integral over the set where f is strictly greater than m, f to the p d mu. But then, if we replace this f to the p with m to the p, then again, you're only lowering these values. So let's see, I think this could be a strictly greater than, um, because f is strictly greater than m at every single point, but just to be safe, I'm going to put it greater than or equal to. Um, there's a lot of times in analysis where you can use where it doesn't matter if you use a less than or a less than or equal to or vice versa for a greater than. And so it typically, like, if you want to be safe, you sort of just want to go with whatever one is the one that matters. Um, so I think I think more is probably true here, but I don't want to spend too much time thinking about it. It, it should be true, but it also could be one of those things. It's, e it's either one of those things that's um, really obvious and it, it, that seems true and is really obvious to prove, or seems true and is false for a very strange reason. Um, although I guess the only reason it could be false would be if this set were measure zero. Anyways, okay, so we're just gonna go on from here. Okay, so this is greater than this, but then what is this? This is m to the p times the measure of the set where f is strictly greater than m. So taking the p-th root, f p equal, is greater than or equal to m times the measure of the set where f is greater than m to the 1 over p. All right, now What, now we have to take the limit as p goes to infinity first. Because something, because what we can use is we can use m, and then we have just the limit as p goes to infinity of the measure of the set where f is greater than m to the 1 over p. So the measure of this set is strictly greater than 0. So we have a positive number getting raised 
to the power of 1 over p. And p is getting sent to infinity. And so the exponent is going to get closer and closer to 0. And so what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with a positive number getting raised to a power which approaches 0. And any, any positive number raised to the, any non-zero, well, yeah, anything raised to the power of 0 is going to be 1. And so this limit is going to be 1. And so we end up with precisely m. All right, wait, I'm missing a greater than or equal to. And now, um, taking the Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, so taking this holds for um, for all m, which is for all m strictly less than the infinity norm of f. So we take the limit now. So we have the limit as p goes to infinity of f p. And what we're doing now is we're taking the limit as m goes, or rather the limit as m increases to the infinity norm of f. Because this, 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 this inequality holds for every m which is strictly less than the infinity norm of f. And so we can take the limit as m increases to the infinity norm of f, and it will always be true. So this limit is precisely the f infinity norm, the, the infinity norm of f. And so we have the reverse inequality. And hence, the infinity norm of f equals the limit as p goes to infinity of f of p. So this is sort of um, this is sort of one of those problems where you're doing a lot of new stuff and you're introducing a lot of new things about integration theory and measure theory and stuff. But when you boil, when you get down to the proof, all it boils down to is you just have inequalities and you're just taking limits, and you have to make sure that you're taking limits correctly and taking limits of the correct variables at the correct times. And so long as you have everything straight in your head, then everything will work out fine, and you'll finish the proof just like we have done here.